Zoomer Life. Health, wellness, and longevity from the world's brightest minds. Come on up here, Sandra. This is Sandra Martin's book. Uh, I love it. It's sort of uh, wonderfully old-fashioned. Um, and like uh, old age, it uh, deals with obituaries, in other words. Sooner or later, we all come Not to you. that point. Yeah? And I want to tell you how uh, I came to know of Sandra's new work because I had met her earlier in her career when she was a journalist specializing in the arts and in media, and that's how our paths had crossed. Um, uh, one day, out of the blue, I get a phone call, and uh, it's uh, Sandra, and she says she's uh, got this new gig. She's now the obituary writer for the Globe and Mail, and uh, they want to test this new thought, uh, which is to do video, right, uh, as well as, you know, scribble on the old piece of paper. And the first thing that flashed through my mind was I get to talk about my own demise in advance. That's kind of interesting. And then I thought, well, I may be a little ghoulish. But then I thought, I get to kind of shape it. I can spin my own <laughs> obituary. And was uh, poised to say yes when I said, uh, when? And you said, now. We have a camera an hour from now. And I was calling you long distance. And so it wasn't possible for me at the time, but that's how I came to know of your new work. And, and a final word, if I may, uh, not to preempt. Um, we, we, we've all um, known of the emergence of our country from a kind of colonial condition into uh, now, I think, a more vigorous, independent, and uh, fulsome sort of country. And, and uh, the mark of colonialism for me uh, in the creative professions where I've worked is not that we import the best you always want to import the best from all over the world. The mark of colonial for me is that somebody else's junk gets access to our marketplace, right? In the case of television or movies, right? Really lousy movies have immediate access to our theaters and good quality Canadian movies have trouble getting in. That's a bit of a stretch, but my analogy is for newspapers who are tight on budget and don't want to invest I got tired of reading about obscure Americans and other kind of international figures who I knew nothing about getting long and lengthy obituaries and wondering where the Canadian obituaries were. So here's Sandra Martin. She is the chief obituary writer for Canada, and I'm finally glad we have one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say, first of all, that I wish you all long and healthy lives. <laughs> no one is in my sights. I am not so eager to write about you <laughs> that I wish you any ill health or any ill deed. Um, before I talk about what I came to talk about, I just wanted to mention the Leo Spellman movie that we just saw. That was kind of the thing that I wanted to do with, uh, with Moses, and um, maybe we can still do it. The, uh, as an obituary writer, I am used to uh, people sort of standing back, you know, the arched eyebrow, almost like Julie was describing when she was showing her, her stoma, because they think that I represent death and all those things. Um, and they like to try jokes on me, as in, you know, who's on your slab today, or what's it like in God's ante room, as though I'd never heard them before. But I want to tell you that obituaries are really about life. They're not about death. Um, death is only the occasion for somebody like me to write the story of somebody's life. And so in the book that uh, Moses showed you, Working the Deadbeat, 50 Lives That Changed Canada, what I've tried to do is to establish three themes. The first is what it's like to work the deadbeat when um, you have people like Moses saying, what, what, no, 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 not just now, not yet, not yet. Or um, I send uh, people an email and I, I've learned over the years to put not about you when, <laughs> when I want to ask uh, people to talk about someone who has died. 
um, I know from working the deadbeat that there are several myths about it, and the one that uh, is the is the biggest is that um, obituaries are all pre-written and left sort of molder into a in a drawer until you sort of pull them out and dust them off. That's not the case. In fact, certainly in my experience, the opposite is true. If you write it, they don't die. <laughs> never. Well, not never, but I will mention a couple of names to you. Nelson Mandela. James Coyne, a very distinguished uh, head of the Bank of Canada. I mean, I don't even remember when I wrote about him, but it, I took such comfort from the fact that he was there. And, you know, he was resting quietly. And then, of course, because you can't predict, he died when I wasn't expecting it. I mean, I was minding my own business last Saturday night, and um, I think I was even cooking dinner or something, and uh, so I heard on the radio that he had died. And I felt so sad for him, but I was also, I don't know, he was 102, it was really great. So then, of course, the, the frenzy starts, and that's usually what happens with obituaries, you do them so fast, uh, in a sort of a blur of phone calls and internet searches and phone calls to people, not about you, but please tell me about so-and-so, and, um, and intersecting with families at moments of terrible grief for them and um, being allowed to share in that moment, and then, of course, stepping back to write the obituary. So that's one of the themes of my book, which is what it's like on the dead beat, and what it's like to call someone and say, I would like to talk with you about your life, um, because I want to write your obituary sometime in the future. And I can remember approaching uh, Flora McDonald about that several years ago, and I said something fatuous, such as, um, I update every five years. And she said, well, you're going to have to. My mother lived to be <laughs> more than 100. So <laughs> there's that aspect of it. And um, then the other part of my book that I want to talk a little bit about is that um, I think the uh, whole way that obituaries are being written is changing. And again, I'd like to draw your attention to the Leo Spellman uh, film we saw today. Now, he's the kind of person I love writing about because I didn't know his name. And so when I learn his life, I want to know more and more. I want to know the context of his time. And I don't want to write it yet. I, please, please understand his family that I would like him to live to be 110 at least. But I will write a journalistic narrative about his life, but it can be augmented now by a film such as the one that Moses made. Um, you can do, write, for example, about Oscar Peterson, and you can write his life, but to be able to link to a YouTube video of him playing the piano adds so much nuance, so much resonance that people who are too young to have known, say, Oscar Peterson can get a real sense of the man and his virtuosity. So that is something that is happening with obituary writing. But of course, uh, the other aspect of it is the social media makes, makes it happen that, uh, that you, know, you can get these messages, um, Gordon Lightfoot is dead. He was at the dentist, minding, well, as much as you can mind your own business at the dentist, when somebody tweeted that he was dead. And he was very good-natured about it. He said, I was wondering why it was my songs were being played in all the radio stations. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't abandon journalistic standards just to take advantage of the latest technology, because a photograph is a piece of technology, a video is a piece of technology. So all those things are really we have to be aware of. And the New York Times broke that kind of obituary mold when um, in January 2007, Art Buckwald came on. I'm hoping you know who Art Buckwald is. He, you know the American humorist and syndicated columnist? He came on the video, if, on their website, and he said, I, with this big grin of his, I am Art Buchwald, and I just died. Now, what he was doing there, he had just died. He was announcing his own death. He wasn't writing his own obituary, but what he was talking about in the interview that we could watch on the, on the website was he was, I think, demystifying death. Death is something that is going to happen to us all in the future, sometime hence, a long time hence, we all hope, but 
It is our squeamishness about death that causes people to sort of step back and, you know, kind of shudder when they see me coming as though I actually embody death. That we need to get over. And the more we talk about it, the more we talk with people who are at the end of their lives and who are, they're not the ones who are squeamish about it. They know what's happening to them. And I find that when I do call someone and say, you know, like William Hutt, you, I really would love to talk with you about your life. They're willing to do it and they're willing to be open. I mean, usually I give them a guarantee that nothing will appear before such time as it may be necessary. And, um, you know, that too could set up a journalistic ethical question for me is if somebody, well, let's not give a name to it, but if somebody actually confessed in a pre-obituary interview to accepting brown bags of cash, what would I do? <laughs> would the promise still hold? So that's the kind of thing you have to be aware of. But the final piece I want to say, um, I'm looking at the, wall, at the clock, it's okay. Uh, the final piece I want to say is that I believe that obituaries are the building blocks of a country's social and cultural history. And I don't think we have a strong tradition of that in Canada. And if you go to Europe, especially to England or United States, you can read books where obituaries have been used to comment on what is going on in a particular society at the time. For example, there were very few obituaries in England after the First World War in the newspapers. People were sick of death. There was enough death. Let's not talk about it. Um, different values become important uh, in, different par in different times in society. The great man theory, it was huge. I mean, when, when um, um, why have I forgotten his name? Um, it'll come to me. It's what happens. Uh, Wellington. I knew it would come to me. Okay, so when the Duke of Wellington dies, his obituary takes 40,000 words in the Times. Now, that would never happen today. Um, and it's all, you know, it was very effusive. Now we're much more, uh, we, we report more, we uh, are more cynical, we stand back, we're more objective. We're not just talking about men, we're talking about women, we're talking about uh, people who would not normally be noticed. And that is another point I want to make about writing obituaries. There is no such thing as an insignificant life. I mean, every story is worth telling. And what I've tried to do in, um, in my book is to take 50 lives, people who died between 2000 and 2010, so the first decade of this century, and write about them, because of course they lived <laughs> in the last century. Um, the oldest person I had was um, a young man who came from China when he was 12 years old. He was born in 1900, came with an identity tag around his neck, paid the head tax, and he lived to see redress. He lived to see Prime Minister Harper apologize in the House of Commons. So we can, by using that life, a name you don't know, we, I can talk about the Chinese in Canada and what happened to them. Um, another, uh, so that's how I've tried to do it, sort of to go through the century. Uh, it's not a, a single narrative, it's more of a mosaic by building these lives. And in terms of, say, the war, there are many people who have come here from other places who have stories to tell about what happened to them during the war. So you get many different vantage points into the war. Um, among the people I have who talk about the war, Lyle Creelman, a nurse who was born here, who was the first public health nurse into Bergen-Belsen uh, in April 1945. Rudolf Verba, who, was, who escaped from Auschwitz and raised the alarm, he ended up coming to Canada. And he was a biochemist at UBC. Um, he, he was always very bitter because he never believed that the Allies acted soon enough on his information, and if they had, um, more lives would have been saved. So there are also people, Smokey Smith, the last man to, the last person to win the Victoria Cross. He's such an interesting guy because he was just an ordinary person. He was a private, he um, was promoted about nine times and nine times he was demoted again because he loved to drink and smoke and do all that stuff that he did. He was not the epitome of a hero. He didn't look the part and yet he was a hero, and because when it came to put his, putting his life on the line, he did it. And not only did he do incredible acts of bravery in, um, in Italy during the Italian campaign, 
he encouraged others also to be brave. And so that, those are the two reasons why he I think he deserved the Victoria Cross. So um, the, I also write about, you know, if you want to talk about free trade, who better than through the life of Simon Reisman. So my point is that each of these lives has a story to tell about themselves and about the context of their time. But taken together, I'm hoping they say something about this country. And I'm hoping that um, this will be the beginning of other collections of obituaries. Whereas, as, you know, as in England, the, uh, the Telegraph series of books, I mean, uh, the people read them all the time. And they do tell us something about our country and something not only about where we've been, but where we should be going and or where we are going. And I think it's just, um, it's, it's, uh, it's an important part. It's not the definitive history, but it is uh, a mosaic, as I said, that will lead us all to, uh, to have a greater appreciation of the country and a greater appreciation, I think, of the lives of people who live here. So many times people say, oh, I can't remember that person. Well, you can if you look and you read and you find out. And what I have found, as I said, is there's no such thing as an insignificant life. Every life has merit. And there are badly written accounts, but that is what the key is, is to try and write them better and to make them more interesting. And um, I think that's all I really want to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to have an autograph. You will. Yes. Maybe you can sit yourself down or go off stage. Are you already? Ah, how good of you. See what I said to you? Ah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. May you live forever. How sweet. Thanks. Thanks. In, in the age of Facebook, uh, I guess now, uh, when someone dies, their, their page stays up, doesn't it? It, it kind of becomes a perpetual obit. And uh, failing that, you can write your obit now, put it on the internet, and make sure it comes out the way you want. 